And here we go. Okay, welcome back to class. Hope everyone had a nice spring break. Um, I spent most of it on my couch, knocked out from the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. So I, I can't speak for the other ones, but if you get uh, that one, be prepared to possibly uh, have a couple days where you're, you're not feeling up to your best, uh, for sure. At least that was uh, that was my experience. It was definitely more severe side effects than uh, than I was expecting, but I'm, I'm happy to have it. So that was that was nice and nice to nice to have it over with. Okay, last time we, which was quite some time ago now, the last time we had a lecture, um, we talked about muscle mechanics um, and introduced that notion of the Hill muscle model. Um, what you really want to keep in mind for that model, just as, as kind of a summary in terms of how muscle works, let's let's revisit that for a moment, just because it was kind of a while ago now. Um, you want to kind of think of muscle in terms of its like gross tissue level, like macroscopic scale mechanics as being some fibers that are connected to a tendon. Okay. Um, the fibers produce a force and how much force is complicated. There's a variety of factors that affect how much force it produces. But regardless of that, the fibers produce some force in response to the nervous system saying, hey, muscle produce some force. They express that force on the tendon and that force stretches the tendon if it's an increasing force or shortens the tendon if it's a decreasing force. Okay. Um, so if you want to visualize this, if you want to kind of visualize how it works, you can grab a a fitness band or a rubber band if you have anything like that laying around and think of the fibers as being me. Think of me as being the fibers. My, my hand and my arm and my muscles here that I'm pulling on this fitness band with, that's the muscle fibers. Okay. So my fibers produce a force and they express that force on this red tendon here. Okay. By expressing it, I mean like my fibers develop say a thousand newtons of force and they apply that force to this tendon. Now, what does that force do to that tendon? Well, it's like a rubber band. When you apply a force to a rubber band, you stretch it. And same thing there with a the tendon. When the fibers apply a force to a tendon, they stretch that tendon. Okay? The more force you apply, the more you stretch the tendon. And then if you reduce that force, like if the fibers drop how much force they're producing for whatever reason, then you shorten that tendon. So why do we have tendons? Why are tendons good things to, to have in our muscles? Well, when I apply my force to my tendon, then when I uh, release that force eventually, then what do I get? Well, I get some energy of motion. I get that strain energy that I stored in the tendon back as kinetic energy. Okay? Now it's not free energy, right? I had to do the work with my muscles to, to put the strain energy in there in the first place. But then when I release that energy, then I can get it back later as, as energy of motion. So it's not free, but I can store and, and use it later on as kind of a source of energy uh, in, in my movement that I'm uh, performing there. Um, the uh, tendon connecting to the muscle fibers there can also help you uh, in kind of more complicated ways in terms of uh, allowing the muscle fibers to contract slowly even though the whole muscle is contracting faster and even though the whole joint is moving fast. So tendons can help us uh, do fast joint level motions with slow uh, muscle fiber contractions, which is generally beneficial for producing a lot of force and a lot of power uh, because of our friend, the force velocity relationship here. Okay. Um, now, another big topic we talked about last time is the notion of moment arm length and how it's not necessarily always good to have a long moment arm for your muscles. And that can be kind of hard to uh, wrap your head around because the muscle force times the moment arm for that force gives you the, the moment or the torque that that muscle produces at that joint. And so you might think for like uh, tasks like jumping or sprinting or sports or whatever that you have to produce large moments, right? And you do. And you might think, well, that needs uh, large muscle forces and it does. And you might think, well, that'd be good for them to have long moment arms, right? Because then I get a big moment for a big force, right? And generally speaking, that would be a good thing. But if a moment arm for a muscle is too long, that can impair how much torque you get at the joint um, by impairing how much muscle force you produce because of this force velocity relationship here. Okay. Um, students I find often have a, a hard time trying to connect those topics, like uh, connecting the moment arm length with the notion of like a long springy tendon being a good thing in muscles. And they're not really directly connected to each other. So you should think of those two topics that we talked about last time we met for class as uh, being related like conceptually, like they uh, both affect how much force a muscle produces in like fast, powerful, dynamic situations, um, but they're not really intrinsically connected to each other. Um, a relatively short muscle moment arm can be a good thing for like fast, powerful, dynamic force production. And a relatively long springy tendon can be a good thing for fast 
fast, powerful uh, dynamic force production, but they're not necessarily related intrinsically to each other. One doesn't necessarily happen because of the other. They're kind of two things that both cause a similar effect, but for different reasons. And so don't, don't spend a lot of time trying to figure out like how those things are connected to each other. Um, they both have a similar effect, but they're different elements or different aspects of, of muscular force production. Okay, exam two is coming up on Wednesday of this week. Um, it's the same style and format and, and overall parameters as exam one, a uh, 50 minute exam. You can start at any time um, on Wednesday from midnight to 11.59 p.m. But note that it closes at 11.59 uh, no matter when you started it. So if you started at like 11.30 and then it's gonna close after 29 minutes even though you didn't use 50 minutes. So if you wanna take the full 50 minutes or your full time, uh, make sure you start it uh, with enough time before 11.59 to, to actually use. Uh, the full time. Uh, covers lectures 9 through 13, which is up uh, through this one. And again, the questions are all based on the uh, focus questions. And so focus on being able to uh, give clear, concise answers to those questions. And that's the best way to uh, study for the exam. Um, if you didn't notice already, um, you might have seen that um, I have uploaded a uh, practice exam or sample exam. Um, it's really just exam two from, from last fall. And so, of course, it won't be the same questions as uh, the exam that you're gonna see on Wednesday. It, it covers similar topics and the same lectures material, but it's not the exact same questions, of course. Um, but yeah, that, that one should be a good way to, to, to do a little bit of a review and to kind of test your uh, preparedness for uh, exam two, if you wanna take a look at that one. Um, it's open now, some people have, have taken it already. Um, it's not graded, of course, it'll give you a score, but the grade doesn't count for your score. It's just uh, just for, for practice and knowledge. And when you finish it, it'll it'll show you the score. Um, you can only take it once, so don't don't uh, waste it. Just uh, spend, spend some time on it. It. don't just rush through it uh, spend some some time on it because you can only take it once you can't take it uh, repeatedly many times but uh, take a look at that if you haven't uh, noticed it already it's under quizzes on canvas and uh, labeled as a practice quiz or something like that okay just to confirm for you that this isn't just a, a conceptual thing that relatively short moment arms can be good for like dynamics sporty type performance um, relatively short moment arms are indeed in practice good for like powerful uh, dynamic sport type tasks. Um, these are some data here on the top from uh, a study in uh, 2008 that related the length of the Achilles tendon moment arm to the economy of running. And so on the y-axis here is the uh, rate of oxygen consumption when people were running on a treadmill at a certain speed. Um, so a lower value there uh, would generally be better. That would be somebody that requires less oxygen to fuel their body when, when they're running at a given speed. And then on the x-axis here is the, the length of the moment arm. So a longer moment arm would be further out here on the x-axis. And you can see here a pretty clear uh, positive correlation between these two variables. The shorter your moment arm was for your Achilles tendon, so kind of the closer your Achilles tendon was to the, the center of your ankle joint, the uh, lower your uh, oxygen cost of running was, or the better your running economy was. And just to be crystal clear on what this actually is here, if you all can see my, my foot there, uh, this is my Achilles tendon back here behind my ankle. And so it would be this, this little distance here from the, the center of my ankle to the center or kind of the, the line of the force direction on my Achilles tendon there. It's that little distance uh, that's plotted on the x-axis there. So having a relatively short Achilles tendon, not necessarily like the shortest one possible, but the, a relatively short moment arm for the Achilles tendon here was, was associated with more uh, economical running. Um, and it's not just for distance running. Um, down here is some data on sprinters versus non-sprinters. Uh, these were individuals at uh, Penn State University. So on the left here is probably like college division one sprinters, so pretty good sprinters. And on the right here were just average sedentary college students. And you can see the sprinters had about a 25% shorter uh, Achilles tendon moment arm than the non-sprinters. So having a relatively short moment arm here was, was good, not just for uh, aerobic performance, but also for uh, anaerobic performance. So just tasks that involve kind of fast powerful motion producing force and performing work rapidly, uh, both across the aerobic and the anaerobic spectrum seems to be a good thing here to have a relatively short um, Achilles tendon moment arm there. So if you wanna know among you and your friends who's uh, the fastest, the best way would be just go out and run a race. But if you wanna guess who's the fastest, maybe look at your Achilles tendon moment arms and see who's, who's got the skinniest ankles there. They, they might be one of the better sprinters. 
Now, why is this? Why is having a short Achilles tendon moment arm a good thing? And here's just another example. This was a, a study I saw recently. I just threw it in the slides here. You guys won't have this one, but it's just another example. Um, it's a, a great example of my favorite titles in scientific papers where it tells you the main result here uh, right in the title. It says longer moment arm for the Achilles tendon specifically uh, results in smaller joint moment development and uh, smaller work and power outputs and fast motions. Um, so if you're doing a, a fast, powerful, uh, plantar flexion contraction with your ankle here. Imagine like pushing your foot down into the ground fast and powerful here, like in the push off phase of uh, running and sprinting, the longer your moment arm was. So if you had a muscle that looked more like this red one here compared to this blue one here, that's closer to the joint there and has a shorter moment arm, um, the longer that moment arm was, the less torque you could produce at the joint during that powerful plantar flexion contraction, uh, the less power and the less work you got out of your muscles. Um, for that contraction. Now, why is this? Well, it relates to this force velocity relationship. And so let me demonstrate this movement again. But for a muscle like, or for a movement like plantar flexion, where I'm gonna be pushing my foot into the ground like that. So like pushing off the ground at the end of the stance phase and running or sprinting, um, that's gonna be a contraction that involves shortening of my calf muscles back there or a concentric contraction of the calf muscles, shortening them while I'm producing force and, and pushing my foot off the ground like that. Okay. The longer the moment arm for that muscle, so the further that muscle is from the center of that ankle joint, the longer the moment arm for the Achilles tendon there, the faster that muscle is gonna have to contract to rotate that joint at a certain speed. Okay. Um, this is kind of hard to visualize, but if you think about looking at, say, a biceps muscle that's really close to the center of the joint. And so picture my biceps muscle like inserting right here, like close to close to the center of my joint and kind of, kind of close to my elbow. As I flex my joint, notice that my index finger here on my left hand is not moving very far and is not moving very fast. Okay. Now, what would it look like if my biceps muscle inserted like clear down here, like out towards my wrist, okay? Watch when I do that same motion, how much faster my index finger is moving here, okay? It's moving a lot further and a lot faster than if it's down here close to the center of the joint, okay? So picture this being a normal path for a biceps muscle with a fairly short moment arm, fairly close to the center of the joint versus a situation where I have a strange path for the biceps muscle. So picture my biceps running from here to here with this big long moment arm. Then that muscle must shorten at a much faster speed to do that same motion and same speed of, of joint motion there. Okay. So the longer moment arm will place your muscle further from the center of the joint and will make the muscle shorten a lot faster versus being closer to the center of the joint and having a smaller moment arm. Um, if it's doing a, a joint motion at, at a given angular velocity there. So the longer your moment arm generally is, the further out here to the left, you're gonna be on your force velocity curve. We're out here to the left is faster and faster uh, shortening contractions okay. where we can produce less and less force. And to get more force, we'd have to ramp up the, the activation of the muscle if it already wasn't at a, a maximum activation. So explaining why, uh, distance runners might be better off with a relatively short moment arm. It might let you operate around here rather than around here. And also for sprinters, for kind of a max effort, max force, max power task, you might be able to sprint faster because your muscles can operate at slower contraction velocities uh, when you're doing a, a fast motion of the joint. So kind of the, the concise summary that I like to give of this topic is that having relatively short moment arms, like having muscles that are pretty close to the center of the joint, lets us do fast joint motions without necessarily requiring fast muscle contractions. By the, the closer the muscle is to the center of the joint, the slower the muscle can contract for a given velocity of joint motion. And the further, kind of on the other end of the spectrum, the further the muscle is from the center of the joint, the faster it's gonna to have to contract to, to do a given, uh, a given joint motion, a given speed of joint motion. Now, this is uh, specific just to tasks that involve like speed and power, things like sprinting and, and jumping and running. Um, for slower tasks, like if you're doing like a, a one rep max lift in the gym, then 
then this stuff doesn't really matter, right? Then I'm not so much concerned with, with power and with producing force and work fast, then I'm just concerned with sheer max force. And it's gonna be a nice slow motion, so force velocity doesn't really come into play here. And so then if you look at like, say power lifter joints or Olympic weightlifter joints, they tend to have these big, thick, wide joints with these big, long moment arms for muscles. Okay? And that's because they're not really concerned with the speed of the motion. They're just concerned with raw force. They just wanna produce as much force and get as much torque at the joint in a slow motion as they possibly can. Okay? So another kind of concise summary here, I don't normally advocate for like memorizing factoids in this class, but kind of a good fact to kind of memorize here just to, to introduce this to yourself is if it's like a fast, powerful, dynamic type task, then typically a relatively short moment arm is good. If it's a slow, like very deliberate max force type task, and you don't really care that much about speed and power, then a relatively long moment arm is good because this force velocity business doesn't really come into play when it's a nice slow motion. Okay, we will continue talking about this theme today, this relationship uh, between muscle uh, kinematics and uh, muscle energetics, and talk a little bit more about the metabolic side of things. How does this relate uh, specifically to that question on the economy of muscular work and muscular force production and the metabolic cost of these things? Uh, and then we'll wrap up with some uh, kind of real world examples of this on the uh, properties of footwear in terms of the shoes that you run in and how the properties of those things uh, can affect your economy and your metabolic cost of, of a movement like running. So muscle, what does muscle do exactly? Uh, it does several things. Uh, muscle always produces force whenever the nervous system asks it to. And it usually performs some work while it's producing that force. Not always, it depends on if the muscle is uh, changing length appreciably, but typically when we produce force with muscles, it's lengthening or shortening and also performs some work at, at that time. Um, regardless of whether it uh, performs any work or not, muscle consumes metabolic energy. So with a muscle, we typically want to produce a certain amount of force. And typically with the uh, effort level of the movement, the amount of force that we need increases. Like generally speaking, uh, as you run at faster and faster speeds, like from a slow jog up to a max sprint, the amount of force you need from your muscles and the amount of work you need from your muscles increases uh, as you increase your, your speed or your, your effort level of that movement. Um, but we're not always just interested in, uh, for example, maximizing like muscular force production or the output of muscle. Um, sometimes we're also interested in balancing what's coming out of the muscle versus what we consume to get that output, right? And that's where the notion of economy comes in, the ratio uh, between how much work I produce uh, versus how much energy I consumed to produce that work or to perform that work. So often in kind of um, sub-maximal effort tasks like long distance running, for example, 5Ks and marathons and stuff like that, then we're not just simply interested in speed, we're interested in the economy of moving at that speed. Can I minimize the amount of energy, the amount of metabolic energy I consume in order to use my muscles in a way that allows me to move at a certain speed or at a certain effort level? Now, this is also an example where um, operating your muscles, uh, whether it's through a relatively short moment arm or whether it's through a long springy tendon in some muscles, where operating your muscles at uh, relatively slow contraction velocities, even though the body itself might be moving fast, is a good thing. Um, on the right here is just the force velocity relationship of the muscle fibers again, um, showing on the uh, shortening side, on the contraction side, that the faster you contract the muscle, the less force you can produce. And this is something we've, we've seen before in the last, last couple of lectures. Um, on the left here is that same relationship, but plotting on the y-axis, not the uh, force that the muscle produces, but the uh, rate of metabolic energy consumption of the muscle fibers when it's producing these forces on the right. Okay. So you can see here, if you look at the kind of the right half of both of these graphs, um, when I'm contracting the muscle quickly, when I'm activating the muscle while it's shortening, or at least while its fibers are shortening at a fast speed, um, the faster the fibers contract, the less force I can produce, um, but also the more metabolic energy I consume. So this is one of, of many reasons why it's generally good to have um, a body that's shaped in a way or to activate your muscles in a way that allows your muscle fibers to contract slowly even though your joints are, are moving quickly. Um, it allows you, the slower you contract the fibers, allows you to produce more muscle force via this force velocity curve um, for less metabolic energy. Okay. 
And you can see here that if I shorten the muscles isometrically, I consume very little metabolic energy. Um, if I activate the muscles while they're being stretched and lengthened eccentrically a little bit, like a slow stretch, a slow eccentric velocity here, then that's actually my most uh, economical position here on my, uh, my energy velocity curve here. And then as I keep stretching the muscles at faster and faster velocity, so like faster and faster eccentric contractions here, um, then kind of like I saw on the concentric side, yeah, my, my energy consumption rate increases, but it doesn't increase nearly as, as sharply and abruptly as it did on the concentric side here. And then if we reconcile that with the force velocity curve over here, that's where we saw that when you're stretching the muscles um, up to a certain limit, um, at, as you stretch them and activate them eccentrically at faster and faster speeds, they can produce more and more force above and beyond your max isometric force. So eccentric contractions here, um, at least for economy and just overall kind of uh, mechanical and, and energetic performance and movements like running and sprinting, um, are generally a good thing in those type of movements. When the muscle is activated eccentrically, it can produce a lot of force via its force velocity curve, and it doesn't have to consume a huge amount of metabolic energy uh, to produce that force. Okay. And this is generally something that whether we know it or not, that, the, that our nervous systems use and take advantage of um, when we're doing movements like walking and running and sprinting. Um, these are the uh, uh, graphs of the timing of when the nervous system uses all the major muscle groups in, in uh, running and normal human running here. Um, you got the hamstrings, uh, the glutes here, the hip extensors, uh, quadriceps, uh, plantar flexors. Um, all of these muscles, if you look at the timing in the black bars of when they are activated in the gait cycle, they tend to get activated right before the leg is going to hit the ground and kind of collapse and flex all those joints and stretch all those big muscle groups. And just to give you a visual of what that looks like. Let me pull up my, my video here. So hopefully you can see most of my whole leg here. But when my, when my heel strikes the ground when I'm running, um, kinematically what happens right after that is my whole leg kind of flexes. Can I make, I'm exaggerating it there. That's more than, than most people's legs will flex like early in the stance phase of running. But generally, at least qualitatively, what happens here is my heel strikes the ground and then gravity and my momentum carry me into the ground. And this flexes my hip, flexes my knee, flexes my ankle. Okay? What those motions are doing is when I'm flexing my hip, that's stretching my glutes. So pulling them up on the eccentric side of their force velocity curve. It's stretching my quadriceps, pulling them eccentrically. And it's stretching my plantar flexors, pulling them eccentrically. Okay. So when those muscles are getting stretched eccentrically around a heel strike here, is, 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 at the, is the same time, if you look at the timing of when those muscle groups get turned on by the nervous system, uh, same time when the nervous system starts asking those muscles to produce appreciable amounts of force in the stride cycle of running here, um, so that it can be active on the eccentric part of its force velocity curve, where it can produce a lot of force and do a lot of work quickly uh, for relatively low metabolic cost. Now, kind of more broadly about this notion of performance and running and energy cost of running and, and the role of muscles and all this. Um, our general goal in running, at least in a, a racing type situation, is that we want to cover a certain distance in minimum time. And this is also the goal for sprinting, right? In sprinting, our goal is to cover a certain distance in minimum time. Uh, for running, say, 40 yards or 100 meters, that's our goal. Um, if we're running three miles or 26 miles in a marathon, that's also our goal. Um, the difference here between running and sprinting is that in running, I have this constraint that I don't want to run too fast because I don't want to uh, use up my energy too fast. Like if I start running a marathon and I just start out at a dead sprint, just sprinting as fast as I possibly can, I'm not going to be able to hold that time or that pace for 26 miles. I might hold it for half a mile or so, and then I'll just collapse and not be able to finish the race. So I got to moderate my speed. I got to moderate my effort in a longer race, like a 5K or like a marathon. Um, the metrics that we usually use in biomechanics and exercise physiology to quantify um, the energy expenditure, the energy consumption by the muscles in a movement like running are these two down here, the metabolic cost and the metabolic rate. Okay? 
Um, they're both the rate at which your muscles are consuming metabolic energy stored in the body, um, but they're rates with respect to just different variables. Um, metabolic cost is the energy that you consume per unit distance that you travel. You can think of this as the calories per mile. Um, you'll sometimes also see this called the cost of transport or the cost in terms of metabolic energy of translating the body's mass a, a unit distance. Um, metabolic rate, on the other hand, is the energy consumed per unit time, the calories per minute, for example. Okay. So metabolic cost is uh, calories per mile and metabolic rate is uh, calories per uh, distance or per unit time. Uh, metabolic cost, you'll sometimes see that called cost to transport and metabolic rate because the units work out to power, you'll sometimes see that called metabolic power. Um, these variables are related to each other with a fairly simple relationship in that metabolic cost is the metabolic rate divided by the speed. Okay. Um, so what we typically measure with like metabolic carts and exercise physiology is the energy per unit time. And then if you know, uh, for example, like the speed of the treadmill that somebody is running on, you can take that metabolic rate and divide it by that speed. And that gives you metabolic cost, the energy per unit distance or, or calories per mile or something like that. So the two key metrics that are typically used to uh, quantify kind of the economy of movement in a, in a movement like running uh, in kinesiology and in biomechanics. Um, in biomechanics, I would say metabolic cost is typically a little bit more, more commonly looked at or more commonly of interest uh, than metabolic rate, but they're both important and both, both interesting me metrics on their own. Now, humans are actually really, really good endurance runners. And we talked about this way back when in class when I was yammering on about the cheetah in one of the first uh, couple lectures. Um, you can also think in terms of the energetics involved here that a goal in distance running is that we don't want to uh, run too fast or, or put in too much effort too early because I'll have to slow down, right? Now, this is something that we probably all have some familiarity with, right? What happens if you're say on a treadmill and you're like, I want to do three miles, but I'm going to put it at an aggressive pace. And you have to stop. You have to slow it down. You couldn't hold that pace. What, what, what do you feel like? What, what, what's the feeling that you have when you decide, oh, I can't make it. I got to slow it down. Well, you probably feel too warm, too hot. You probably overheated, right? Um, humans are exceptionally good at regulating our body temperature. That's one of the reasons why we're among the best uh, endurance athletes in the animal kingdom. We're really, really good at controlling our body temperature while we're exercising via a uh, lack of body hair and an extensive system of sweat glands and ability to easily hydrate ourselves and, and things like that. Um, but nonetheless, this is a constraint that we have on our performance in a, 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 like effortful endurance type movements is we don't wanna overheat. We don't wanna heat up too much. Um, another common goal that you might see in, or in, a, in energy expenditure related to something like running or like exercise is that we might not necessarily want to minimize metabolic costs. We might not necessarily want to be as economical as possible. Um, in some cases, we might want to be uneconomical. If I have 30 minutes to exercise and my goal is energy expenditure or burning calories or weight loss, then I might wanna run in a way that, uh, at least to, while I can avoid overheating, I might wanna run in a way that burns a lot of energy that is uneconomical. If I have a certain fixed amount of time and I wanna burn as many calories as possible. Um, kind of the overall theme here is that the way that you perform these movements, the way that you do the mechanics or the, the motion of your body has an effect on the energy that you consume because those mechanics affect and reflect the underlying mechanics of your muscles that relates to the consumption of the energy at the whole body level. Now, metabolic rate here, um, when we're running, that increases roughly linearly with running speed. So as you double your running speed, roughly, you double roughly the amount of calories that you burn per minute while you're running. Um, metabolic cost, interestingly, is more or less invariant to running speed. And you may have heard this before, that it doesn't matter if you run a mile slow or run a mile fast, uh, you burn about the same amount of calories running that mile. Um, you'll burn them faster if you run the mile fast because you'll be done sooner, but the total amount of calories that you burn when you run a mile is more or less invariant to the speed that you run that mile at. And these were some classic data uh, that first examined these things for walking and running back in the 1960s, where you can see walking has uh, what's called a curve linear relationship here for speed, where my uh, metabolic rate here, so calories per, per minute is what's shown on the y-axis here, uh, for walking as I walk faster and faster uh, increases parabolically with speed. Okay. Whereas for running, my calories per minute here uh, increases linearly 
with speed as I run at faster and faster speeds. So different shapes or different kind of uh, gross level mathematical relationships here between speed for these two different common gates in human running. Now, if you take these metabolic rates and divide them by these speeds down here, then you get metabolic costs. And that's where you see, if you look at this top graph here, ignore this bottom one down here, that's where you see some interesting things start to emerge in, in uh, the differences between walking and running. Um, here for walking, we see this U-shaped relationship between metabolic cost and walking speed, um, meaning at a certain speed in the middle here, at kind of a moderate uh, average walking speed, that's when I'm most economical on the basis for uh, calories per mile. Like if I'm gonna walk, uh, three miles and I want to minimize my energy consumption, I'd want to do it at a moderate speed. Um, it wouldn't minimize my time, right? That would be done by walking at the fastest possible speed. But if I want to minimize the energy consumption it takes to walk a certain distance, then I would want to use the moderate speed somewhere in the middle here. Um, but for running, we see this very different shape here. For running, we see this, this one's actually trending downward a little bit. Um, but for running, you generally see a pretty flat curve here where it doesn't matter if you run slow or you run fast, you burn about the same amount of calories per mile to run regardless of what speed that you're, they're run, yeah, that, uh, that you're running at. Now, some animals have really interesting, uh, even more impressive uh, relationships there between metabolic cost and running. Um, that notion of the metabolic cost of running in humans being relatively invariant to running speed is thought to be one of the main advantages that humans had uh, back in times of yore, and this wasn't like hundreds of years ago, this was like millions of years ago, um, before grocery stores and uh, automobiles and things like that, humans had to hunt for food, and we often had to chase down uh, faster quadrupedal prey that we were trying to, to catch and to eat. Um, most four-legged animals have a U-shaped metabolic cost curve, whereas humans have a flat metabolic cost curve when they're running. And so the idea there was that a, a pack of humans could chase a four-legged animal at a speed that's inefficient for that animal, but that is invariant for the human. The animal would run out of energy first and the humans uh, could catch it. Um, a human could never do that to a kangaroo because can't, not that we'd want to eat kangaroos. I don't know why somebody would necessarily want to do that. But if you did, for whatever reason, want to catch a kangaroo, um, you probably couldn't do it. Um, why? Because kangaroos are super remarkable animals in the animal kingdom in that the faster that they hop, the more economical they get. Um, it costs them uh, fewer calories, not just per mile, but actually fewer calories per minute to hop faster and faster and faster and faster. So the faster they hop, the more efficient they get, regardless of how you quantify that efficiency. And here's an example of Mr. Kangaroo hopping along here at pretty fast speeds. Now, why are these guys able to hop so economically like this? Um, I don't think there's any other animal in the entire animal kingdom uh, that has that, that relationship where the faster they go, the more economical they get. Well, it's hard to see here. I'll try and freeze it here at a, a time where you can kind of see it. But this whole length of material right there that you can see kind of bulging out on the back of kangaroo's leg there, that whole stretch of material there is the Achilles tendon of the kangaroo. Um, they have an extremely long Achilles tendon, and they also have an extremely strong and thick Achilles tendon. You can't really see it here, but these are these are big animals. They're very, very large. And their Achilles tendon looks like a like a steel cable. It's an enormous, like thick chunk of tendon that they have there. And so it's very, very long and springy and flexible, but also very, very strong and can sustain very, very large forces and store very large amounts of elastic energy and then return that as kinetic energy. And so this is thought to be why they are such efficient hoppers and that the faster they go, the larger and larger forces they're producing on this big thick Achilles tendon, it's storing tons of strain energy and storing more and more as they produce larger and larger forces hopping and faster and faster, and then returning that energy as, as kind of free quote unquote kinetic energy. I uh, saw a question in the chat up here. A uh, student says, if it's more economical, are they always able to run at the top speed when covering long distance or is body temperature um, a constraint sort of as a trade-off? Um, I don't know a whole lot about like long distance travel in um, uh, kangaroos here. I don't think they typically hop for like five, 10 miles at a time. I think they'd typically be doing a gait like this for uh, maybe like a few minutes at a time. And so this probably isn't something that they could sustain for like 
uh, marathon distances. And so pro probably if you were like going to race a kangaroo in a marathon, you as a human, you could probably smoke a kangaroo in a marathon. I don't think they have the physiology to, to sustain efforts like that. But if it was going to be like a sprint over like a mile, uh, the kangaroo would easily uh, win that race. You just wouldn't be able to, to keep up the speeds that it would be able to keep up because of its, its, um, its magic Achilles tendon here. But over very long distances, I suspect because of uh, their lack of those things that I mentioned, their, their thick body hair and lack of extensive sweat glands and things like that, a human would probably win over a very long distance. So it'd be nice if we had these rig thick Achilles tendons as humans, we'd probably be great uh, endurance runners. Our legs would probably look funny, but you could probably set marathon world records, but we don't have that for whatever reason. So we're not, we, we have normal human Achilles tendons. So with these constraints that humans have, um, what can we do to improve our performance here? Lacking a uh, superhuman Achilles tendon like a kangaroo has, what can we do within the limits of our human physiology to affect our performance or to affect our economy and metabolic cost here uh, for running? Um, generally, for like racing purposes, you want the lowest possible metabolic cost or the best economy. Um, for exercise purposes, you might want to do the opposite. You might want to, uh, at least within the realm of safety and comfort, might want to raise metabolic cost or maximize metabolic cost. Uh, but regardless of which direction we want to go, we might be interested in how can we uh, make changes to how we run or what we run with to affect metabolic cost here meaningfully. Um, a nice thing here is that it doesn't take uh, huge changes in metabolic cost to be meaningful here uh, for, for a movement like running. Um, if you pay at all much attention to like the footwear world and running, you've probably heard of the uh, Nike Vaporfly 4%, which is the, the hottest shoe on the market right now. And the 4% in the name there means that running in this shoe on average reduces metabolic cost of running by about 4%. And that's a, a very large amount for, for most uh, endurance type running activities. So even small changes like one to 2% uh, can be very meaningful for performance in long distance type races. Uh, a change of 1% is roughly two minutes in a marathon at, at average speeds and is about 12 seconds in a 5K. And if two people were racing and, and somebody beat someone by two minutes in a marathon or by 12 seconds in a 5K, uh, that's, that's a pretty good butt kick. And those were not terribly close results if, if, the, if two competitors were separated by, by that amount. So even like small one to two, three to 4% differences here in uh, economy and efficiency for running can be very meaningful for performance. So how can we achieve this? What, what sort of things can affect uh, metabolic cost of running by, by small percentages here? Uh, footwear might be the most obvious one, right? Um, that'd be the quick fix, right? Can I run in different shoes? Can I uh, just put on a different pair of shoes or a certain type of shoe? And this affects my metabolic cost meaningfully. That'd be the quick thing, right? The easy thing. Solve the problem with money. Buy a special pair of shoes. Wear a special pair of shoes. Um, the harder thing would be change your mechanics, how you move, right? Uh, change the properties of your muscles with training, right? Those would be feasible things that could affect this, but more long-term things. Is there a quicker thing? Is there a quick fix, like with changing the type of shoes that you wear? Uh, two possible issues here. There are two characteristics of running shoes that uh, indisputably, and to me indisputably at least, can have a substantial effect on the economy of running. Um, the mass of the shoe and the uh, amount or type of cushioning in the shoe. Um, the other main thing that you'll hear about here uh, for like design of running shoes is motion control shoes. And this, this has kind of changed a little bit in, in the, the recent decade or so, but historically for most of like the existence of the footwear industry, there's been two types of running shoes. There's been cushioned shoes and there's been motion control shoes, which try and control the motion of your ankle joint in the frontal plane. Uh, motion control shoes really don't do a whole lot for performance and economy, um, but cushioning can have a big effect on performance and economy and the mass of the shoe absolutely can have a big effect on performance and economy. Um, it's not just about the shoes either. Um, the style of running that you do, the mechanics with which you, you run as an individual can have an effect on things like speed and, and metabolic cost. Um, for example, the type of, or the, the footfall pattern that you use, which is an indication of the part of the foot that strikes the ground first when you run, whether it's the heel or the toe or both about the same time with the flat foot, uh, this can have an effect on uh, energy cost of running and performance and things like that. And we'll talk about that uh, at, at some topics further down the road in class. But for now, let's focus on uh, properties of the shoes and kind of the quick fix here to what, what might affect energy cost of running. So running shoe mass. Um, generally, having a relatively light shoe, and I might go to the extreme of saying having the lightest shoe possible is uh, best for metabolic cost of running. Now, why might a heavier shoe be bad? Well, a shoe or the mass of the shoe, even though it's typically a fairly tiny fraction of somebody's body mass, uh, can have a proportionally large effect 
on the energy cost of something like running. Um, this is largely because um, the mass is located a long way from the hip joint and because you have to swing that mass through the air in the swing phase. Um, if your foot is relatively heavy, like if you strap a relatively heavy shoe to your foot, um, this will generally increase the amount of work that your hip flexor muscles have to do in the swing phase to pick that weight up and to swing it forward and get ready for the next stance phase, uh, resulting kind of, if we think back to that angular mass topic, in a big increase in the leg's moment of inertia. And I can give you another visual example of that. So remember here, when I, when I finish my stance phase of running, I tend to pick my leg up and then swing it forward with my hip flexors there to get ready for the next stance phase. Um, you don't see a lot of people who barely pick their foot up a little bit off the ground and then swing the leg forward when they're running, right? When we walk, we typically do something like that. But when I'm running, I pick my leg up fairly high and then swing it forward and then put my foot down. Now, why is that kind of high leg kick and swing a good thing? Well, by picking my leg up like that, I'm concentrating that mass of my leg close to my hip joint center, okay? So I'm moving that mass close to the center of my hip joint, which is reducing the moment of inertia, reducing the resistance to rotation of my whole leg so that my hip flexor muscles can swing that mass forward with relatively little effort and relatively little resistance. So the lighter my running shoe is, the less the mass of my whole leg is, and the less the moment of inertia my whole leg is going to have for a given uh, pose of the leg there in the swing phase. Um, on the other end of things, the heavier my shoe is, the higher the mass of my whole leg is going to be, and the higher my moment of inertia is going to be in the swing phase, and the more work it's going to cost me, primarily by my hip flexors, but just by my body in general, to swing the leg forward there and complete that swing phase and get ready for that next stance phase. Okay. So having a, a heavy running shoe is generally a bad thing for economy. Uh, having a light running shoe is generally a good thing uh, for economy, um, not because of the stance phase, but because of the swing phase, because I have to swing that mass through the air and it costs more effort to, to swing a heavier mass through the air there with relatively small muscles of, of the hip flexors. Now this makes sense if we go back to our first law of thermodynamics here, just muscle energetics 101 here, where I've got my muscle and I wanna perform some work, such as the work that I have to do with my hip flexors to swing the leg forward in the swing phase. Okay? This is gonna result in some consumption of energy and it's gonna result in some of that energy get converted to heat inevitably rather than getting converted to work. So if I want to, or if I reduce the amount of work that I have to perform, um, then that's also just kind of downstream there gonna reduce how much metabolic energy I have to consume to perform that work. Now, this notion of the work done by muscles, this is kind of a hot mess in the biomechanics literature. Um, if you dig deep into the biomechanics literature, or even in some of the, the readings and the textbooks that I give you guys to, to take a look at, uh, there's like, we all know what work is, right? It's force times distance, but there's like a bazillion different types of work in biomechanics. It can all get kind of confusing and overwhelming. Uh, there's the work done by the whole muscles, you know, the fiber plus the tendon. There's the work done by just the fibers. Uh, there's the work done actively by the fibers. There's the work done passively by the fibers. Uh, there's the work done by joint moments on the joint, which is kind of similar to the muscle work, but not exactly the same thing. Uh, there's the external work. That's the work done by the ground reaction force on your body. And then there's also the internal work, which is the work you do uh, moving your legs or swinging your legs uh, relative to the center of mass. So lots of different types of work here. Um, generally speaking, based on what we just talked about, um, we would expect having a, a heavier shoe to primarily affect this internal work here, this work that you have to do uh, moving your legs relative to your center of mass, uh, particularly in the swing phase of uh, running there. So let's examine that in a little bit closer detail there and think about, can I uh, change the mass of my shoe and get an appreciable difference here in my, my internal work, in my work that I do moving my legs relative to my center of mass by changing shoe mass here over a realistic range of, of, of masses that shoes might plausibly be used by people. Can, can this have a meaningful effect on energy cost of running? So suppose we increase the mass of the shoe, a delta M here. So my, my shoe mass is M and I'm gonna increase it by an amount delta M. 
of 100 grams or 0.1 kilograms. Um, is that a lot? That's, that's a decent chunk of mass for a shoe, but it's not a implausibly large change in shoe. It's not like strapping a bowling ball to your foot, which will of course make it very hard to run, but is, is not realistic. Um, running shoes typically weigh anywhere from like 50 grams to like 500 grams. Okay, so an, an addition or a change here of 100 grams, you know, can you make a shoe 100 grams heavier and still have it be a realistic mass? Yes. Um, can you take a shoe that's 200 grams, you know, kind of in the middle there and plausibly reduce its mass by 100 grams or 150 grams? Yes, those, those are plausible, possible things that can be done and that designers of shoes actually deal with. So suppose we increase the mass of a shoe by 100 grams. Um, how much more internal work would we have to do swinging our legs with our muscles because of that extra 100 grams? And we can do some quick kind of uh, back of the envelope energy uh, calculations here to get kind of an estimate of this. Um, every step that I take, I have to lift that mass up to, you know, finish to complete the stance phase and start the swing phase. Um, I have to lift that mass of that shoe up uh, by about 20 centimeters or about 0.2 meters. And that's the height I have to pick that mass up off the ground to, to swing it forward in the swing phase. Um, when I'm swinging it forward in the swing phase, I have to do that to, to run at a decent speed in a race like a marathon at an average speed of about uh, 10 meters per second. Okay, that's the average speed that I have to swing my, my uh, foot mass forward in the swing phase to, to complete that swing phase in a reasonable time at, at a marathon type racing uh, speed here. And in a marathon, I'm going to do that uh, about 20,000 times to, to complete a, a full marathon with a, a normal size shaped body, normal leg lengths and, and normal types of of speeds here. So each step I take, uh, picking that mass up 20 centimeters, swinging it forward at a velocity of 10 meters per second, and doing that uh, 20,000 times during the race. Okay. So this here, change in height, this should hearken us back to potential energy, right? Energy due to gravity. Okay. This one here, the speed that I have to move that mass at, that should hearken us back to kinetic energy, right? So every step I have to add potential energy in accordance with this extra height and kinetic energy in accordance with this extra velocity. And how do I change those types of energies? How do I, <clears throat> excuse me, how do I add that energy? Well, that's our energy work theorem. I have to do work on that mass with my muscles to uh, add the kinetic or the kinetic energy here and the potential energy there. So let's do some calculations here and figure out exactly how much extra work it takes. So my extra potential energy, that's going to be mass times gravity times height. So the extra 0.1 kilograms times 9.81 gravity times the 0.2 meters of lifting that shoe up every step times the 20,000 steps. Um, that works out to an extra 4,000 joules of uh, work that I have to do picking that mass up with my leg muscles uh, during the marathon race there. Okay, how about for the kinetic energy? How about having to move that mass forward at a certain speed or accelerating it up and through a certain speed uh, when I'm swinging that mass forward in the swing phase? Well, the kinetic energy there would be one half times that change in mass, 0.1 kilos, times the average speed of the swing, 10 meters per second. Square that whole thing, take it times 20,000 steps in the whole race and you get an extra 100,000 joules. So add those together there, the extra 100,000 joules of kinetic energy uh, plus the extra 4,000 joules of potential energy, you get 104,000 uh, extra joules of uh, work that you have to do there with a shoe that's 100 grams heavier. Um, is this a lot? That's actually quite a bit. Um, the total work that you do in a marathon, and this varies based on many factors, but it's roughly in the ballpark of 10 million joules of work that you have to do with your muscles in a, in a race like a marathon. So 104,000 joules is a little bit over 1% of the total mechanical work that you have to do with your muscles in a marathon. And that's important, that matters, right? Remember differences here on the order of one to 4%. These are meaningful differences uh, for economy and for performance in a race like a marathon. If you could design a shoe, this has sort of gotten upended by Nike, which has shoes that do four to 6% average reductions now. But prior to the last couple of years, if you put a shoe on the market, that definitively and clearly improved metabolic costs by 1%, you would be a billionaire. This would be, a, you could retire at probably age 50 and, and live comfortably on your yacht for the rest of your life. This would be a huge deal in, in the footwear industry if you designed a shoe that, that saved energy by, by this amount. 
Now, if we want to convert this to, to numbers that we have a little bit more familiarity with, like food calories and things like that, um, let's assume that muscles are about 25% efficient, meaning if I do one joule of work, I spent four joules of metabolic energy getting that. So I multiply my 104,000 extra joules by four, and I get 4, 416,000 joules of metabolic energy I'd have to consume because of this extra shoe mass. Um, if I do the unit conversion there, that equates to about an extra uh, 100 kilocalories of food uh, during of, of energy consumed during a marathon. Um, that's 3.8 calories per mile, which is again going to be about 1%. Um, that's a lot. You know, 3.8 may not sound like much. You know, you eat a cheeseburger and that's 500 calories. But runners, generally speaking, in a race like a marathon, every 30 to minutes to every 30 to 60 minutes or so, so roughly once or twice every hour or so, we'll eat about 100 kilocalories worth of gels and Gatorade and things like that for uh, hydration purposes and for, for fueling purposes. And so saving an extra 100 calories here with a light shoe, uh, that could be one less feeding that you have to do during the race, for example, which, which could feasibly uh, save you some seconds over, over, uh, over a competitor in the race. And so these things, even though it doesn't sound like much, these things can, can add up, especially when, when every second counts if you're going for like a world record or winning a high level race or something like that. Now that calculation there where I got 100 grams of uh, shoe mass equating to a, a increased metabolic cost of 1%. Um, this isn't just back of the envelope calculations that this one actually was and I got kind of lucky there with the numbers that I made up. Um, but this is actually something that's been shown in practice in uh, the footwear industry and this is kind of a guiding thumb rule. Uh, based on a, a famous study done back in 1985, that with every extra 100 grams of shoe mass, this increases metabolic cost of somebody running in that shoe by about 1%. Or if you want to put more of a positive spin on it, um, every 100 grams of shoe mass that you save or that you reduce uh, decreases your metabolic cost by about 1%. So generally speaking, running in the lightest possible shoe is uh, most economical for, for the person running in that shoe. And just to prove that this is indeed a, a, re a reasonable, realistic amount of mass for shoes to vary by, this is this slide's a couple years old. I haven't updated it recently, but this was the heaviest uh, Nike shoe I could find. It was about 420 grams, and the lightest Nike shoe I could find was about 34 grams. And so a, a range of, of adding, you know, 100, 200, 300 grams, or saving 100, 200, 300, 400 grams in running shoe mass. These are are realistic things in, in running shoes. Realistic design considerations in, in real running shoes that people really use. So some implications for performance here. Uh, generally speaking, you don't wanna race in your training shoes. Training shoes that you might train for a race in tend to be a little bit heavier uh, for protection purposes and comfort purposes. Uh, this will increase your energy expenditure in a race and you don't want that. Um, should you train in your racing shoes? Should you wear those light shoes all the time when you're, when you're training? Well, probably not. The, you, might, you might wear them out kind of fast, right? So there'd be a financial cost there. And also they may not have some of the, the protective features, some of the cushioning features that a heavy shoe might, might have. And we'll get, we'll get to that uh, in, the, in the last topic for today. Um, you might also think in terms of racing or in terms of training, maybe I should just run barefoot, right? If the lightest possible shoe is the best, let's just set that mass to zero, right? Let's just not wear a shoe. Let's not add any mass to the feet. Let's just run barefoot. Um, and that's been kind of popular lately. It's kind of fallen off the uh, kind of fallen off the, the popular attention a little bit. This was big for a while, you know, running barefoot, running without any shoes or designing shoes that mimic barefoot running, which is kind of an oxymoron. But this was a popular thing for a while. And in theory, this should work great, right? If I run barefoot, then based on everything we just talked about for the last 25 minutes or so, uh, that should minimize my metabolic cost of running. That should be the most economical way to run, right? And you can say, see that I've seen, you know, dot, 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 right, question mark there. I mean, maybe there's a surprise coming in. Maybe it's not necessarily the most economical way to run. But in theory, it seems like it should be based on what we just saw. Um, it has indeed been shown that running barefoot versus running in typical shoes um, does consistently reduce metabolic costs. That's, that's been pretty definitively proven that if you are running in normal shoes, if you take off your shoes and then run barefoot, um, your metabolic cost will immediately go down and it'll go down by quite a bit, sometimes uh, up to uh, about 5% or so. Uh, a comment in the chat here, which I was going to get to, a pebble could end it all. Um, that's one of the big reasons for not running barefoot all the time is that the cushioning on the shoe is not just for 
uh, economic savings, the, the cushioning or the surface on the shoe is also for protection, right? Like I used to uh, live in Washington, DC up, to, up until a few years ago. And I would occasionally see a dude like out running barefoot on like the sidewalks of Washington, DC. And I'd be like, aren't you worried about like stepping on a, on, on a razor blade or like a pile, a pile of vomit or something? That's, that's not really things that you normally uh, want to step in. But so the, the cushioning on the shoe is not just for uh, comfort, it's also for protection, for avoiding stepping on things. But in the absence of anything that's kind of overtly dangerous, like if you're doing this on a, on a treadmill and like a, an exercise test or something, um, taking your shoes off, whether or not you're experienced with uh, running barefoot or not, uh, invariably reduces metabolic costs and sometimes by, by substantial amounts in metabolic cost. Um, however, those experiments are typically done with uh, heavier running shoes. And they typically are then removing two things about the shoe. They're removing the mass from the shoe but they're also removing the cushioning of the shoe. And so we might wonder, is that cushioning a benefit on its own? Um, what's the effect of cushioning in the shoe independent of the mass of the shoe? And this might seem kind of spacey, like kind of hypothetical and not all that useful in practice. Like you can't remove just the mass, right? You have to remove the entire shoe. So you have to remove the mass and the cushioning. But what if I didn't have to? What if hypothetically I could kind of have the best of both worlds here? What if I could take away the mass, but keep some of the cushioning? would I then have metabolic savings or is the cushioning on itself useless? And it's just like the student just asked, is it, uh, is it just for protection? Is it just for not stepping on things and hurting my foot? Or is there an actual mechanical energetic benefit to cushioning uh, in and of itself, independent of the mass of the shoe? Um, this next study here that we will wrap up for today is one of my favorite studies of all time in biomechanics. It was done by, by a friend of mine, Jason Franz, when he was a, a postdoctoral uh, researcher. Um, I just thought it was a really clever, really creative experimental design at getting at this question of what's the energetic effect of the cushioning of the shoe isolated from the mass of the shoe. Um, what they did here is they compared the metabolic cost of running barefoot versus running in shoes, just like many studies have done, but they controlled for the mass in those comparisons. Um, the data here look kind of complicated. They did it for a variety of mass conditions, but essentially what they did here is they had you run on a treadmill in your shoes. They then took the shoes off, but added little lead weights around your ankles back to your foot to replace that mass of the shoe. Okay. So then I have a comparison of two conditions. I have me wearing the shoes with the cushioning of the shoe. And then I have me running barefoot without the cushioning, but with the mass added back to my feet so that I have the same mass on my feet as I did when I'm running in my shoes. Okay? So if I make those two comparisons, then I can have an isolated comparison of the energy cost of running with and without the cushioning independent of any differences in mass because the mass was added back um, after I took the shoe off. I saw several questions in the chat here, so let me take a look. Uh, what is shod? Sorry. Um, shod is the, the fancy biomechanics way of saying in a shoe. So if I'm running shod, that means I'm running with, with shoes on my feet. Sorry about that. Okay, and so you can see here that in each one of these comparisons, um, regardless of how heavy the running shoe was, whether it's a 150 gram shoe, or a 300 gram shoe or a 450 gram shoe, um, regardless of those comparisons, the condition where I was running with the shoe, with the cushioning, was always the lower metabolic rate than the condition where I was running barefoot with that same mass added back to it. Um, suggesting that there's an energetic benefit to cushioning in the running shoe, that the cushioning in the shoe is not just about protecting the foot, that's, that's obviously a good thing about shoes if you're running on, on things that might hurt the foot, um, but the cushioning in the shoe um, in and of itself has a benefit on the energy cost of running and on the economy of running. So two things that can independently affect the energy cost of running, um, the mass of the shoe and the amount of cushioning in the shoe or the type of cushioning in the shoe. And uh, this, this idea re results from studies like this is really the impetus for kind of modern uh, running shoe designs where kind of the uh, pie in the sky, like ideal running shoe, at least in current times is a really, really light shoe that also really has a really, really thick, uh, really squishy, really high energy return amount of cushioning in the shoe. So kind of taking advantage of the best of, of both worlds here, a light shoe that also has a lot of, of cushioning inside the heel of that shoe. Now, some open questions are why do these things, the shoe mass 
and the, uh, the uh, shoe cushioning lower the metabolic cost. For shoe mass, it's, it's fairly straightforward. We went over an example here of how this, this would feasibly affect energy cost and why it would feasibly affect energy cost. Uh, but for cushioning in the shoe, it's a little bit more of an open question. Uh, does it result in less muscle activation to support the body weight? Uh, do the muscle fibers contract at slower velocities, similar to some of this business we talked about, about moment arms and tendons earlier on? Uh, is it some other thing? We don't, we don't really know. This is unknown right now. It's an active area of research in, in footwear biomechanics and running biomechanics right now. Um, it's been shown that shoes with certain cushioning properties can uh, lower energy cost of running by appreciable amounts. But the kind of uh, smaller scale sources of why that happens or why the shoes work in that way um, is still an open question right now. So no, no clear uh, answers to these open questions right now in terms of why they work. We just know that they do appear to work. Now, an important missing component here, and this will be the last uh, topic for today. Um, an important missing component here is this idea of motor learning. Um, most of these studies that you see when uh, there's comparisons of like different types of running, like different foot strike patterns or uh, running in different shoes or just any, any sort of change in how people run or what people run in are typically uh, short term studies where you hop on the treadmill, you run in one condition, you put on a different pair of shoes, you hop in those shoes, you might be in the lab for like a total of an hour or so when you do these things. Um, that's a short-term test, right? That's very quick and immediate effects of, of this different shoe or this different style of running. Um, a signature of learning, if you're performing in like a new condition or a new movement or new conditions of a movement that you're not used to, is that when you first start doing this new unfamiliar movement, your metabolic cost might initially be pretty high. And then as you practice, as you get better at it, your metabolic cost will tend to decrease as you get more experienced and more skilled and more used to doing that movement under those circumstances. And it can sometimes decrease dramatically. Um, so some implications for us when this and the kind of things we talked about today is that most of these studies in running in like new novel shoes or running with like different strike patterns and things like that are short term studies. They were done on that same day with that person uh, having their immediate uh, responses to these things measured. Uh, there's no, at least that I know of, uh, yet no long-term studies on how like uh, running for years with a different strike pattern or running for years with different types of shoes um, affects metabolic costs. Those are of course logistically more difficult things to do, um, but they're probably more relevant to, to the uh, people actually using these things in practice where you don't, you know, use a shoe and then run in it for five minutes and that's it. You use the shoe and you, you train in it for months and you run, you run and train in it for years sometimes and might be interested in uh, longer term consequences here. Um, just to give kind of a fun example to wrap up here of uh, the, the uh, consequences of these things and just an example of, of motor learning in action here. Um, this was a study by another friend of mine, James Finley, on uh, the reductions in metabolic cost uh, when we're doing something unfamiliar. And so typically the presumption here would be that when I do a new, like weird, unfamiliar movement, initially I'm not very good at it. And a signature of that is I'm inefficient. I have a high metabolic cost. But as I get more practiced and more skilled and more familiar at it, metabolic cost decreases. Um, this was a study where they had a split belt treadmill. So picture a normal treadmill that just has one belt on it. Um, but instead, it's got two belts side by side. And they could set the speed independently of those different belts. They didn't have to both be going at the same speed. So here is just an example and the white dots here of somebody walking on the treadmill for uh, 10 minutes with both belts set to one meter per second. Um, they then increased both belts uh, to 1.5 meters per second. Metabolic cost went up, of course, you walk faster. Uh, they decreased them uh, both to 0.5 meters per second. Metabolic cost went down. This is what we'd expect to see. Um, they then did something fun. They set one belt to 1.5 meters per second and one belt to 0.5 meters per second. Okay. Um, I don't even know what that would feel like or look like. It seems like it'd be kind of strange, but imagine like your left leg going 1.5 meters per second and your right leg going 0.5 meters per second. So going three times faster with your left leg than your right leg while you were walking. Um, I don't know what that would look like or feel like, but it certainly would be a very strange, unfamiliar task. And we'd certainly expect the metabolic cost to be pretty high. Um, that was initially what they saw here at the 20 minute mark when they set them to these uh, uh, non, non symmetric speeds on these belts with the, the left belt at 1.5 and the right belt at 0.5 saw a sky high metabolic cost here like three times as high as the normal metabolic cost of walking. Um, but then the person kept doing it kept doing it kept doing it kept practicing it kept walking on it. Um, after just about 20 minutes of walking in that very unfamiliar condition, they got their metabolic cost here back down to on average the same cost as when they were walking 
in the normal condition with both belts going at the same speed. And that's only over just you know half an hour here or so of practicing this. Um, even in, in most studies of running shoes and running biomechanics, you don't see like uh, half hour periods of accommodation here for, for learning and training in these things. And so this is, I think, a, a missing element of many of our studies here that we, that we do in biomechanics on kind of the longer term consequences or motor learning um, effects of, of, of learning to use these new things. So just kind of keep that in mind when you're reading studies um, of this nature, that there's typically not uh, looking at long term effects of training in these things. It's very short term um, immediate changes in, in terms of energy cost of running. So when that total, sh foo sh <laughs> total shoe foot mass was matched, uh, the energy cost of running was lower, suggesting an independent effect of shoe cushioning or just more generally the, the interface between the foot and the ground um, on the energy cost of running independent of the mass of the shoe. So if you want to have a uh, effective running shoe, typically you want it to be really light and typically you want it to have not necessarily a, the most cushioning possible, but a, a moderate amount of cushioning, kind of, a, kind of a Goldilocks amount of cushioning, not too much, not too little, just the right amount of a cushioning coupled with a relatively light shoe for, for the best uh, energy cost of running. Okay, that is it for today. We will see you next time.